Now, I, I've heard that you weren't initially intending or wanting to go into medicine at all, that you wanted to, you wanted to study Shakespeare. That's correct. I was going to study literature, but then I ended up in medicine. How did that happen? Well, I, I loved English literature, and that's why I wanted to study. And I loved Shakespeare and uh, wanted to really specialize in that. But my mother wasn't comfortable with my decision. So she asked that I consider medicine. And I said, no, I don't want to do medicine. I love literature. So she kept saying, well, literature is a tough career. And I want you to think about medicine. You're good at biology and you should think about medicine. And we went back and forth on the topic. And I was holding strong that I'm going to study literature. And I think when she realized I wasn't budging, she started moping and crying and being really upset about it. And I couldn't stand it. I said, fine, I'll do medicine. So that's what happened. Do you regret that all at ever? Don't regret it. I, what she told me is literature could be your hobby. You can read all you want and you can write whenever you like. And I did follow that advice. I did read and I enjoyed uh, a lot of writing small things, but uh, she proved to be right in that in medicine, it's really important to communicate well and to write you know, medical articles clearly and in a cohesive way. And many of my colleagues tell me that my articles read like a story. And I think that's in part because of my love for literature of telling a story. So I think she was right at the end of the day. Just another important context for, for putting you into the place you are right now is that you don't come from Houston in the United States initially. You, you come from a war-torn country on the other side of a big ocean. Tell me about your, your childhood history. Right. So I grew up in Beirut, Lebanon. And when I was growing up there, I thought life was really wonderful, idyllic. I loved my childhood there. I loved growing up in Beirut as a teenager. And my dream was to be accepted by the American University of Beirut. It's the dream, uh, you know, premier university in the region. And once I got accepted there, I was very, very happy. And I thought life was wonderful. Finished college and started medical school. And then uh, during my first year of medical school, the Civil War started and things got so hard and dangerous because there were bombs falling all around the campus that I really, we had to make a decision. We were a class of 63 students. We had to make a decision whether to go home for the year or stay on campus but to finish the year. And the professors and the students, we all met and we agreed we're going to stay and finish the year. But that meant each of us has to find safe uh, places to stay at night. So we had to all live in double-walled rooms. You couldn't be in a room with windows. And there wasn't much many choices. So my choice was a closet within the ladies' room. That's where I slept for six months on the floor. And the year ended, and by the end of the year, things were escalating, and my parents were really worried about us. And I had two younger brothers, one of whom was injured by a stray shrapnel. So my parents asked me to come to the States to stay with, uh, I had relatives here, just for the summer, thinking the war will end. And I came thinking, I'm here just for the summer. But unfortunately, things escalated, and I found myself in October find, having to find a medical school that will accept me as a transfer student because I couldn't return back. By the time October came around, the airport was closed. All entries to the country were closed. I was wondering if you thought that in any way colored the rest of your life, that, that the fact that you came from a place that was so uncertain and so troubled um, made you make certain decisions as you went for, further, further along. I think it did. Uh, I would tell you it was really the following year that probably also influenced my life significantly. Clearly, it was 
very devastating to have to be away from home, away from the, my other 62 classmates. I was loving medical schools with my friends, thinking I have to now be separated from them, find a new place. It was already tough enough, but uh, also ending up in a medical school where I didn't know anybody. Uh, in, I ended up in Nashville, Tennessee at Meharry Medical College, where Nashville is not necessarily an international city. And back then, modes of communications were much more difficult, especially with Lebanon at war. There were no phone lines. So I would sometimes spend six hours trying to dial via an operator. You had to call the operator for international calls just to make sure my parents are okay. So it was a tough year where the parents were under the threat of bombs and I'm in a place that I don't know anybody. It was a very tough year. And I would say that's really what shaped me because that became a milestone year. Every time I met a challenge, I figured, but there was that one year when I really didn't know how to manage feeling homesick in a new country, not knowing anybody. Uh, I managed that year, I can manage anything. So I, I always use that as a landmark. And at the end of that year, I packed all my things and went back home, determined to go back to Lebanon and stay there even during the war. But my professor said you'd be better off graduating from an American medical school because the war is not going to end anytime soon, go back. So grudgingly, I returned and I finished medical school here, and I ended up obviously staying. They were right because the war lasted, you know, many years after. Now, it's interesting you say that you learned to face challenges by facing that, that really war challenge in the first place. The challenges you faced are, are really quite amazing, and I, I want to fast forward, I guess, to Rett syndrome, which has been something that you're now famous for. Um, tell me about the challenge of Rett's and how you came to focus on this as really a, a life's course. Yeah. There were really two, two sides to the challenge of Rett syndrome. The first side was seeing the girls who are born healthy and who learn how to do so many things lose their ability to speak, lose their ability to use their hands, lose their ability to move smoothly, breathe easily. And every function, really, they've learned how to do is pretty much lost by the time they're two to three years of age. And then they will have seizures and many other medical problems. So it was very heart-trenching for me to see these girls. And I, I met the first one in 1983 when I was still an intern and in, a resident in neurology. I really couldn't forget that. And having by chance seen another girl like her the following week, when nobody has really heard about this syndrome or seen patients with these disorders in America, that's when I realized if I saw two in one week, there had to be more. And once I dug into the clinic records and find more such patients, I just couldn't imagine the challenges of the girls and the families having a child who's born healthy and then having to go through the regression and then having to be stuck, not being able to do all the things that uh, typical children will do. So to me, that was really the first challenge is, is how do you face that? And having seen enough of these girls and how similar they were, I became convinced that there has to be a gene to explain it. Otherwise, why would they all look similar and why would they all be girls. So that's really what convinced me that this must be a genetic disorder. Of course, the challenge there in assuming it's a genetic disorder and going after the gene is that they're isolated cases, which means there's one in a family, which means they're not large families where you can map where the gene is in the genome. And back in the 80s and early 90s, the genome was not sequenced. It was not mapped. We didn't have the proper technology to really go after a sporadic gene. It was truly like looking for a needle in a haystack. And for me, for one reason or another, that wasn't to me a challenge, believe it or not. I knew it has to be there, and one day we will find it. 
I think the challenge was there, there was not the technology to help me find it fast enough. So I just kept doing it brute force effort, very slow paced, you know, looking gene by gene on the X chromosome. I figured because they're females, I've got to be on the X chromosome. So that was sort of, I was fine with that pace. I think the challenge was the world around me where people thought this is really a crazy undertaking. This is career suicide. You'll never find something that's a sporadic disorder and so on and so forth. So it was really, as a young investigator, being faced with that, that was pretty tough. I was patient, you know. Of course, it was frustrating that it took so long. But I think the challenge was the world around me, including trainees. Very few people wanted to work on this project because everybody looked at it as an impossible project. So I was fortunate that I could always convince one trainee to work with me um, on this project. And I think, you know, I'm very grateful that at the end, Ruthie was one who stuck with that for three consecutive years and then we were able to find the, the right gene. I, I want to talk certainly about the, the challenges the, and the long-term challenges that you face, but just simple question, how, how likely is it or how uncommon that you would meet two people within such a short period of time who are, are suffering from a, a very uncommon syndrome? I know. I, you know, Rett syndrome taught me, I, I study another rare disease. Both of those two rare diseases I've studied really taught me that expect the unexpected. You're absolutely right. For a disease that is one in 10,000 people are affected. No one has yet in this country seen patients with that disorder. I see a patient one week and the following week, I had selected the child that I wanted to see. As a child neurology resident, we get to choose what we want to see. And I picked cerebral palsy because to me, cerebral palsy mean, meant it's a diagnosis no one has figured out. And I want to figure it out. So I, that's why I always pick diagnoses that are a little bit challenging. So I chose to see the child with cerebral palsy. And literally, you open the door and you see her standing there wringing her hand, just like... Uh, you know, Professor Andreas Rett and Bank Hagberg has described, I was struck and I immediately recognized the disease, although I had an experience with just one patient. But having read the paper from Europe and having seen the one patient, it was very easy to recognize. And that's amazing. You're right. I mean, I would have, that's serendipity, but it also tells you rare things happen. In fact, on that note, as I was trying to find the gene, I met a family where two females who are second half cousins had, the, had Rett syndrome. Both of them had Rett syndrome. They're only related through a great, great grandmother. And I was convinced they're related. And I was convinced they're going to help me map the gene and find exactly where it is on the X chromosome. Well, when I did the experiments, they shared nothing of their X chromosomes. They shared absolutely no region on the X chromosome. And it, when I got that result, everybody told me it's time to call it quits. Because if this was really a genetic disorder on the X chromosome, here are two girls with Rett syndrome related to a great grandmother, and they shared nothing. So I, I chose to ignore that and pressed on. When we found the gene... The first two girls I went back and sequenced were these two girls, and both of them had Rett syndrome. They both had mutations, but they had different mutations. So now you see Rett striking twice in two girls that are related, but just independent mutations. That's why I said it's a humbling disease. I've learned to expect the unexpected. Uh, there's a quotation that I, I read from you that I'd like to hear you unpack, and that is that when you come to work every day as a researcher, you don't know what to expect. Exactly. I mean, I think the beautiful thing about science is you come to work and an experiment might have started the day before and you're eager to hear what happened and you come and look for it. You don't really always know what to expect. And most of the time there will be surprises. And I think for me, I like that about science. I mean, after now a, a, a career of 30 years in science, if you ask me 
to distill what makes research such a sustaining career for you? What makes you so energetic and excited about science after 30 years? I would say it is really the thrill of learning something. And you will learn something. It may not be the result you wanted, but you will learn something new. It's, it's just, I just find it, it, you know, you don't really ex know what's going to happen. And that's what I find very sort of exciting about being a career in science. And of course, for me, as someone who cares about neurological diseases, you feel you're getting closer to your goal of one day making a difference for the people affected with these diseases. Some people would find that depressing or discouraging. You find it exciting and inspiring. I, I do. I think there's a part of me that likes to solve puzzles. And I think that when I come and it's not what I got, there's usually another result and I pay attention to it. And invariably, things I have observed or things we found out in the lab that didn't turn out the way we expected, when we followed them, they led to something very, very exciting. And that's, to me, is also really what makes science so much fun, that there's, there's so much knowledge you're acquiring by doing experiments and by asking questions and trying to answer them, that you may not always get all the answers you're looking for for the problem you're trying to solve. But along the way, you'll discover amazing things, and they help people, they help solve problems for some families that you have not expected. So that's to me is very rewarding. So I think the combination of wanting to solve puzzles and the ability, I always tell people in my lab, walk into the lab with two eyes in front, you know, looking forward and make sure they have, you have a couple of eyes looking backward. You have to look all around you. There's so much to notice and so much to follow on. There's a lot of wisdom in that, I think. Now, you won the Gardner in 2017, which is really recently. Is it too early for you to try to assume or try to make any statement about what it's meant in your career? Well, it, it meant a lot in my, my career. It really, first of all, it, it's one of those prizes that I held in the highest regard so just to be named, you know, Canada's International Gardener winner is a big deal for, for me as, a, as really an honor and recognition of the work we've done. It's interesting because I don't think of the work as in the category of getting prizes or being recognized. I think of it as a sort of means to get to my ultimate goal. I feel like the prize I'm after, which is making my patients better, it's still, you know, I'm, I'm working hard towards that. But I think it was a great, really, uh, recognition. So that meant a lot to me from that point of view. And then from a second point of view, I think the week I spent in Canada visiting various institutions and speaking to different scientists and connecting with the high school children was one of the most rewarding experiences. And I came back and I started I'm on a couple of other prize panels. I told them that, you know, the Gardner does it right. And they really need to be thinking of learning something from that. Because for me, the most rewarding experience during that week is really connecting with these young students and talking, speaking with them and sharing our work with them and seeing their excitement, seeing how engaged they are. And it just makes you feel good. It makes you feel the world will be okay. They're going to be young people. When I'm long gone, they're going to do great work. And that's fantastic. You know, and I think that prize gives you that feeling because you're seeing it, you're, you're meeting hundreds and hundreds of these children, young people. So it's really very exciting. So that's on another level. And then on the third level, it was, you know, unexpected great gift. So I could put it the words project that are high risk. So it will enable me to take some risk in the research that I might not have taken with funding that was slated to do particular experiments. So it allowed me to push the boundary of the research even more. 
So I think when you really think about it, it was really rewarding at so many levels, morally, uh, you know, just as a moral support and recognition of the work for me and the lab, and then interaction and with people in Canada and seeing these young high school students and their energy that you feel in the room when you speak to them and then enabling me to do even more, you know, perhaps risky research that otherwise might have been very tough to be funded. And I don't think it's a chance occurrence that I won the Gardner in 2017 and three of my trainees within the span of 12 months ended up in Canada as faculty members. That's an excellent benefit for Canada. We, we, we're very lucky that you won it too, then I guess. We benefited from it. No, it's really true. I mean, I had one who already has been there. So that right now, within the last four years, four of my trainees are all at Canadian universities. And it was so sweet yesterday one of them sent me a picture. They visit each other and they send me their picture together. And I cannot tell you how heartwarming that is. So, so I think that, you know, I think this was a huge gift to me. And, and I hope that as more and more trainees do stay in science and some go to Canada, that's hopefully one way I can sort of show my gratitude. Well, obviously, you mentioned outreach, and you mentioned talking to young people, to students, medical students, high school students, as being an important part of what you, you've taken from the Gardner. Can you give me some exp specific examples about that? I mean, you spoke to classes, you spoke to people. Was there, are there, is there one incident, or are there many incidents that you can remember that might symbolize that? There were really many incidents that I felt my week was so worthwhile, and I, I really felt that was the highlight. First of all, um, speaking with the high school students, obviously uh, seeing the questions they asked, you realize that they really are paying attention, that if you make the effort to tell them the story in a way they can understand it, they are really 100% engaged. So to me, that was wonderful. Many of them wrote to me, some of them wrote to me afterwards, saying how much they enjoyed it, saying how much they're inspired to go into science. That's extremely rewarding. I had a special session with, in Toronto with many of the female scientists at the University of Toronto. Some of them were young, some of them were more senior, but that was also, to me, that was an inspiring session because I think that hearing, you know, a meeting with women, sharing your experience and how you've had a rewarding career in science and, and managing life and managing being a mother and a wife and a scientist and still feeling highly, you know, um, satisfied and happy. I mean, I wouldn't trade my career path with anyone. I think Interacting with those, that was really a highlight because, again, many of these uh, women scientists wrote to me afterwards and some of them stay in touch and some of them want to make sure we stay connected and so on and so forth. So I think that was really highly rewarding. And uh, in every university I visited, I met with, uh, you know, gra graduate students and fellows and trainees. And again, they are really uh, eager to hear how did you navigate your career path and learning to, to see what they can, how they can do it? Because it, it's very hard. You have to imagine these young people that are looking at Gardner Prize winners, right? And they think, oh my goodness, I can never do that. And what's really important when I meet with them, I unpack my lab for them and I, I highlight for them where at their stage they're probably far more accomplished than I was. And once you really walk them through these steps, they realize, okay, then I can do it. And I think that's really important. So th this to me was also very, very important because I, I feel that we need to encourage people. We need to let people know that it's really a rewarding career. It's really a career that's very fitting. A career in science is so compatible with having a life, with having a family. Um, and it gives you, I think when you're happy, 
you can navigate anything. And I think when you're doing research, especially research you're passionate about, you're happy. And I think that's the essence of enjoying a career. I think it's important that you you both acknowledge and accept the, the, the crit, not criticism, but great praise of the fact that you are a woman and you're an example as well as somebody who, who can teach them. You, you, your very existence is, in, in a sense, a lesson. And how important is that for science, that suddenly half of the, the human race is uh, moving into a field that it was sort of excluded from in the past? Yes, I, I, I think that I feel really a responsibility to really share some of my experiences and share how I nav navigated certain things, you know, to do the work I wanted to do. Because sometimes I feel many women, more so than men, even some young men, but more women than men, have self-doubt. I think, am I going to be able to do this? And I feel this is where I am very um, genuine and I share that it's natural to have the self-doubt. I had the self-doubt. Honestly, when I started my research career as a postdoc in a wonderful lab, I told my husband, I'm giving this five years because I don't know if I'm like the rest of scientists. I am not, some of them I feel like they're big sharks and I don't know if I can do that. I'm very small. I don't know anything. I'm starting totally from scratch after being tra trained in medicine. I have to see if I can survive this. And I'm going to give it five years with all my might and power. But if I can't do it, I'm going to go back to practicing medicine because I just don't know if I can do that. Because I didn't have many female role models. I was intimidated whether I can make it. So... I, I share those experiences and I share the fact that I had self-doubt with today's trainees. They, they feel, face different challenges. There are a lot more mentors now and mentors are much more understanding of uh, women scientists, but I also think they share many new challenges. You know, I went home, there was no email and no texting and none of that. So I could really focus on my family when I went home. And today, I think there are a lot of distractions. So, but I think by sharing that and sharing exactly how it can be done and why it can be done, I feel that that's usually helpful. At least that's what many young women scientists tell me. Now, one of the things about the Gardner that, that people often talk about is that they say it's, it's a sort of test run for a Nobel Prize. And now you just won the Gardner a year ago, but do you think of it that way? Do you think, oh, maybe that could happen? No, I don't like to think that way. I really, I told you what's my prize and that's the one I'm waiting for. It, my prize will come when I come up with some treatment that will make some of these children and adults better. And I honestly, that's sort of, if you, you know, we all set goals and we all have dreams. And this is the goal I set and this is the dream I have. And, and honestly, I've been fortunate to have the Gerdin and many other prizes, but it all came unexpected. And I think that's what makes them so special. So I think for me, I hope my goal and dream to one day bring some really effective treatments will come when I least expect it, because then I feel that's really the biggest prize I'm looking forward to. That's an important comment to make, I think, about prizes in general. And, and medicine is one area, but prizes everywhere. What do they mean in a career? Do they give you a kickstart? Do they push things along further? Or might they actually have the opposite effect of once you've done that, you don't have to do anything more and they sort of hold you back? I mean, what do you think about prizes in general? So I tell you what they mean for me. I cannot really tell you what they meant for everybody. But for me, I view them as a recognition for the lab. And for me, what I really get excited about is seeing how my lab members feel and seeing the pride they feel. And it's amazing from those who graduated 20 years ago to those who are currently working at the bench. I think you see the effect on them. And I think for me, that's what it really means the most. 
Um, I think in some ways, the, you know, for me at least, the financial rewards of them have been able to help me push the science and push causes I really care about, which is mentorship, supporting young trainees, and, you know, su- recognizing those that made a difference in my life, whether it's my, you know, alma mater, the American University of Beirut, or my mentor here uh, at Baylor College of Medicine who really set me on the right path. These are the kind of things these prizes really allow me to do. It's allow me to recognize these people who've had such an incredible influence on my life and allows me to enjoy seeing my lab members feeling proud and feeling that their work is being recognized. Um, But, you know, that's for me. I don't know how it is for other people, but I would tell you it's really, that's why in every prize I never miss a beat recognizing the people who got me here. There must be, and I, I don't want to put myself in your place. I couldn't put myself in your place. But when when you look, you receive a prize like that, and, and you look at the people who have won it before, you must feel almost in awe of of, of what you what you've achieved. Really, you you you're now in a list of people who are really must have been your heroes in some yeah. sense. It is true, but with that comes responsibility. And comes the responsibility that you now have to be that for the next person, right? How about the future then of, of the field you're in? And it's a much bigger f- field, obviously, than rats. I mean, neurodegenerative disease includes the spectrum, Asperger's, Alzheimer's. I mean, all of these things are involved. Do you feel that the work you're, this, the major moves you've made, the major advances you've made, are actually making advances in that wider field as well? Right. So I, I think that. Uh, for the last two to three years, I would say, it's, it's the first time I'm starting to feel really excited about the prospects of changing the landscape in the management of many devastating disorders. I think you have to t- recognize that 20 years ago, we had no clue what caused many of the diseases. So the past 10 years brought a solution to begin to understand the causes of many diseases. And I would say the last two years are really opening opportunities for us to begin to intervene and treat some of these diseases. And I think therapeutics are going to come in more than one shape and form from the traditional, perhaps typical pharmaceutical pill to treat a particular disease, like, you know, the statins will treat, you know, high cholesterol to DNA-based therapies, maybe the antisense oligonucleotide in a degenerative disease like spinal muscular atrophy is one of the best examples. And hopefully one day gene therapy will also be advanced to even in my field, at least, manipulation of the brain network. So I think I I see us moving forward in more than one way. And I wouldn't forget that for the more common diseases, of course, the rare diseases are typically single gene disorders and genetic, and they have to be treated in a certain ways. But for the more common diseases, I think there's a lot of things we can also do uh, through, you know, making sure the environment and lifestyle and all the things we do in our daily life, from diet to the air we breathe to the activities we do, all of that can contribute to brain health. So I, th- I, I see that we've learned so much more and we're finally having, you know, pathways to hopefully make a difference for some of these diseases. It, it must seem like the most exciting p- time possible. You, you're living in a time when the genome has been revealed in, in ma- ways that couldn't have been anticipated and, and computers are making medical science a different field, really, from what it was 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. This must look like uh, you're, you're on the edge of something really, really exciting. It is, it is really, really exciting. And I, I, I think that, you know, I wake up every day literally still as excited to come to work and thinking about work and thinking about how to solve certain things as I did, to, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Because... It's even better. I mean, back then it was more, 
there's a challenge, I want to solve this puzzle. But now you feel like there's enabling technologies that you can do so much more. And it must be wonderful as well to see some of the people that you have inspired, some of the young people you talk to now stepping up to move into the position you were in 20, 15 years ago. Absolutely. And that's really my favorite part. So I think that you didn't ask me the question, but I'm going to give you an answer. Uh, you didn't ask me, what do you feel is your most important accomplishment? Um, and I think if you were to ask me my most important accomplishments, I would say it's, besides my family, obviously, I would say it's my trainees. Because they are amazing. They give me hope that science will be in good hands and they are so dedicated and such a great you know group of people that are really have the passion to carry on with the same passion that i did and i feel that will multiply me hundreds times over so i think they are really my i would think my trainees are my pride and joy and probably the thing i did the best if you'd ask me in the lab what was the question I should have asked and answer it? Well, that was, that was really one. I mean, I just, it, it, I, I think that uh, I just wanted to bring that up because that's really what I'm most proud of. And, um, you know, initially I had such deep gratitude for my mentors because they made me, you know, some of them taught me clinical medicine and taught me how to be a scholarly clinician, not to be just satisfied with superficial information, to dig deep, to observe. So that I'm very grateful with. And then my science mentor really taught me how to be a great scientist. And I always felt such a great uh, sense of gratitude for them. And I never really, for years, I would never know how to pay them back. And when I started getting prizes, I even felt more gratitude because I felt it's those people that helped me get to where I am today. And I finally get it. I got it that the way I pay them back is really through being a good mentor to my trainees. And that's really, I think, so that's, you. you it takes time to realize these things. You don't realize it when you're just starting your lab and you're running around with your graduate student doing experiments. You only realize it after a while, after they've left and made their own discoveries and they're having the same passion. So that's why I wanted to share that with you. There's a lot of wisdom in that and I, I really appreciate every answer you've given to me. It's been great to meet you, however electronically and perhaps with certain barriers between, but uh, congratulations on your work and thank you for your work and thank you for this conversation today.